Hello, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is uh, Stephen Mutimba, the course director for the Climate Information uh, Services Training. And today we are going to deal with the uh, module three. And module three is on co-production, communication, and use of climate information services. So co-production of climate information service is a relatively new term. And this is because in order to better understand the needs of the climate service users, approaches to climate service have been strengthening interaction with users. Before we used to say um, CIS users or climate information users, but, but because of this uh, the need for the user to input into the type of climate information, the term has now changed. So with, with co-production, there's a focus of uh, incorporating users' expertise into the development and also the communication of climate information products in a user-producer dialogue process. So this is a process whereby the user says what they want, and the producer, you know, tries to produce exactly what uh, the user wants. So this is what we call uh, co-production. So it's a process called co-production where producers and consumers come together to generate credible and tailored to the consumers. So it's challenges traditional. It, it, it challenges uh, traditional models of knowledge production, which are often very top down whereby knowledge is produced by actors such as scientists in academia or technical experts or bureaucrats, for example, and is then transmitted to users of the climate information service. So co-production recognizes collaboration, producers and consumers making it a, a salient and legitimate knowledge. So co-production, has been driven by the fact that there's need to better understand climate services users need by strengthening interaction with them and where necessary, incorporating users' expertise into the development and communication of climate information products in a user-producer dialogue process. So this dialogue process often results in what is commonly referred to as co-production, while co-production has become a central process within climate services, climate service as a term encompasses a much wider range of activities and outputs. So according to the lessons learned, lessons from the WISER program, and you can, and in the report that you get, it, it does talk about WISER program, so make sure that you read the bigger pro, uh, uh, report that you're going to get. So according to the lesson from the WISER program for project implementers on enhancing production in climate service projects, co-production, particularly between scientists and stakeholder decision makers, is, in critical, is very critical in ensuring that climate services are designed and communicated in a way that best serves decision makers. However, despite widespread agreement that co-production of climate services is necessary, there remains an array of approaches to co-production. So it's still um, a science that is developing, and so there are so many ways in which you can approach this. So this range from predominantly defined, predefined static consultative process to those that are more emergent, iterative, and flexible. So, Co-production is normally influenced by several factors. There's the specific context. Um, there's the people who involved. There's the purpose and availability of funding. You know, this has brought about co-production spectrum, which is arranged from which ranges from consultative co-production on the far left and immersed co-production on the far right. Far right. So it, it's a continuum. So on, on the on the far left, we've got uh, you know people who are still thinking about it. 
uh, which is a consultative, and then on the far right is a uh, massive co production whereby now we've agreed on what we want. So when it comes to the building blocks of co production, um, they're about uh, six. And the first one is you identify key partners and build a, a partnerships. And then you build on common ground. You co-explore the need. Then you co-develop the solutions. And then co-develop, um, co-deliver the solutions. And then you evaluate. You know, so the, the first approach is that you're looking at, instead of saying that these are users, you say these are partners. You know, the partners that you want to work together to come up with climate information service. Then you build the common ground here means you agree on what the user wants, and then you call explore the need. Is it possible to be done? And then you develop together, call develop together that is the solutions. And then you deliver the solutions, and then you evaluate whether that solution is working. And that's what you call the, the six building blocks of uh, co production. So this is why we say that climate information service is a process of two-way communication and involves uh, providing context that turns data into information. That is uh, somebody by the name Schaefer. Um, and the common methods of, 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 of communication actually include uh, when you're trying to now deliver the information, it includes the use of traditional med media channels such as uh, television, radio, and newspaper broadcasts. It also includes the information bulletins, which contain more detailed information and analysis of weather uh, forecasts. The most, uh, uh, this day we've got even more modern method of communication, and this includes the use of internet, whereby you can send an email to to your to the user, or uh, you can. Uh, go to the National Meteorological Service website where they have the information. You can also send it by social media. You know, you can use Facebook, etc. And then the other ways in which you can display and um, you can do public displays and, and social for forums. And this includes things like billboards on the roads. In community organizations and in barazas. Barazas simply means meetings. There's also text message services. And these days, it's becoming very common for people to pay. So there's uh, paid services such as the, 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 uh, the short message services, that is the SMS. There's also free messaging services such as WhatsApp, etc. All those are ways of communicating climate information. Then we have on demand. This is where a client um, has made a certain demand or request. And this is, happens mostly in the transport sector, in the aviation industry, in big agriculture, and in marine, you know, so you demand and you are provided for information upon uh, if you requesting for that information. So that's just a, a photograph uh, or a picture showing a public weather presentation, which is very common, which has been very, very common. Sometimes we have the radio, which is also common in terms of uh, delivering uh, climate information. And this is what we are calling the traditional way of delivering a climate information service. This one, as you are growing up, I think this is the only method that was available until uh, mobile phone came in. Then you have the public displays, you have websites and social media, and you have emails. 
So I, I just want us to discuss a little bit how uh, the NHMS are working to disseminate data services to, to communities. And you have a provider and um, the provider, and this is now where co-production is becoming very, very important. So the provider um, makes sure that he understands what the user wants. And then um, he to make sure that the provider also has the appropriate, has understood the appropriate application where the climate information service is going to be used. And the provider now goes ahead and um, uh, collects the information, um, analyzes the information, packages the information in such a way that the user has access. And access here simply means that um, the user can afford that information, the user can understand that information, and the user can use that information in an appropriate way. So this is a very good uh, diagram of um, a, a very simplified uh, diagram that shows um, provider user interaction, which the where, where the terminology now for production is being used. What you need to understand is that um, end user is becoming outdated, therefore we're using more the word co-production. But for the sake of this course, some of the end users are farmers. As you know, climate information is very important for farmers because it can save lives. It can also contain losses, especially when it comes to harvest time. It can increase productivity and reduce risk, especially the risk of diseases and pests for crops. So reaching rural farmers sometimes is a challenge because they do not use, for instance, the internet. Some of them do not have mobile phones. Some of them, education is very low. They have a low literacy level. Yeah, they have low literacy level. So uh, there's need to come up with ways in which you can reach them uh, at a regional and village level into account the cultural and linguistic uh, differences, you know, because the language uh, problem becomes uh, an issue here. So, and this is why the emphasis these days is on co-production because then that information becomes more usable by them. And the other group are just local communities. And here we are focusing on the community leaders, the farmer, farm cooperative leaders, the village leadership, the regional politicians in that area, the community, children, teachers, parents, whatever it is. So, and there are also those who do not work in farming, like the local NGOs, and we have uh, medium scale local enter entrepreneurs. So the best way to make sure that you have this information is to engage them, uh, discuss with them what they need, uh, what is their um, village, um, when does it occur? That's the only way now you can come up with data. When you have at national level, we have uh, we have uh, policy makers, and this is uh, a group which comprises of national leaders and uh, national hydrometeorological uh, sessions. We have the Senate or uh, Hall of Representatives in, in Africa, mostly we call them parliament. We have the executive branch, ministries, media, large private sector enterprises, um, like the mining, the banking, universities, ETC. So this group has a very different uh, need for climate information and the need for co-producing together becomes even more uh, uh, crucial. Then we have the private sector and the private sector here have been given 
um, a separate role because the private sector are actually leaving when it comes to uh, benefit from uh, tailored weather information uh, to protect human and physical resources and make climate smart business decision. And they can also play a role in disseminating messages. For instance, the private sector um, businesses that own huge farmers and work with the outgrowers schemes or outgrower farmers, uh, small scale farmers, they make sure that they get this information and they disseminate the information to uh, their group of farmers in the outgrow scheme. They also uh, play a role in the sense that um, those who own transport uh, fleet of vehicles, they also um, disseminate this information to all their vehicles where they are. And then we have the government ministries and agencies. And um, climate information is very important for these ministries, especially those involved in disaster risk reduction and management, those who are involved in water resource development, those involved in forest conservation and environmental management, those um, involved in um, um, aviation industry, in financial services and banking, in energy development, in health sector, you know, in Africa, Whenever we have a lot of rain and it's flooding, sometimes we get, mal we get malaria, we get diarrhea. When it's very hot, we get some other diseases like leishmaniasis, ETC. So it's important that this sector get the data and information that is um, well um, uh, packaged for them. And then that, that photograph simply shows the farmers going to the farms and the weather looks okay, but they need to know that they, the weather is going to remain okay for them to stay in the farm longer. And then this slide just uh, summarizes the groups of um, um, users who are also potential co-producers. We have communities, we have private sector, and we have policymakers. And anybody who needs to make a decision on a matter that is affected by the weather, and climate can benefit from a climate information service. So this uh, diagram is simply showing the the, six, uh, the five uh, groups which we have discussed who are uh, potential co-producers and or end users of climate information who are farmers, private sector, policymakers, local communities, government ministries, and agencies. And then. We now have uh, other users of, or, or other providers of uh, climate information. And here we are focusing on the regional uh, institutions because in each country, in every country, we have a national hydrometeorological station. But um, they are also linked to regional institutions. For instance, we have the African Center for Meteorological Application for Development, ACMAD which focuses on capacity building. So it, it builds the capacity of the 53 national meteorological services of the countries there who are in Africa, they are member states of Africa Union. And it focuses on weather prediction, which is the climate information. It, it focuses on climate monitoring, looking at the extreme events. It, it focuses on transport technology, like telecommunication, computing and rural communication and research. So it's a very, very crucial uh, body. And then we have the Intergovernmental Authority and Development, a Climate Prediction and Application Center. And this one is based in um, East Africa countries, uh, focusing on Kenya, um, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, and um, South Sudan. And it provides climate information and services to both private sector, public institution, and interested interested parties. I'm a member of this. I get information from it on a daily basis, sometimes on a weekly basis. And its service are geared to increasing resilience and minimizing weather shocks. You know, because the whole of the Horn of Africa, those of you who know East Africa very well, especially Kenya, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Eritrea, there's a lot of drought there. So it focuses in, in increasing resilience, especially 
so that uh, communities are not, you know, uh, they get this information early enough to protect them from the weather shocks. And then we have South African Development Community Climate Service Center, which was established in 1990, and it provides both climate information and service and training for countries in the southern region. And um, in West Africa, we have the West Africa Science Service Center on Climate Change and Adapted Land Use. And this is a research facility for guiding policy make and provision of climate information service to West African states. It also provides training and capacity building to NHMS to countries in the block. That is, it provides capacity building for uh, national hydrometeorological service for the countries. And in Southern Africa, there is the Science Center for Climate Change and Adaptive Land Management, which is mostly a research center for climate change, adaptation and land management. So it does not provide uh, climate information service as those above, but it is more of a research center to increase resilience of its member states to climate weather is through better land management. It also serves five South African countries mostly South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Angola. And then we have other service providers who are global. And um, the, the ones who have been very, very important in Africa is the UK uh, Met Office, or UK Meteorological Office, which is referred as the Met Office. And um, it provides critical weather services and what leading climate science it helps users make better decisions to stay safe and thrive, and the, the information they provide reach and usage is actually very, is, is global. And then in the US, we have what we call the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is also uh, global, and it's a leading organization, especially in international ocean, fisheries, climate, space, and weather research and science. So it provides a lot of of information on Atlantic Ocean, especially because that's where um, a lot of tropical storm, storms come from. Then we have the Copernicus EU, which is the European Union's Earth Observation Program, which looks at uh, planet and its environment to benefit the European citizen. It offers free and open access information services that draw from satellite Earth observation. And we have uh, number four, the European Climate Assessment and, and Dataset, which was initiated by PCSN in 1988. And it has received financial support from the European Commission. And it, it is a, a project that provides information on changes in weather and climate extreme, as well as the daily data set needed to monitor and analyze um, extreme in weather and, and climate. Then we have the European Center for Medium Rain Weather Forecast, which is both a, a research institute and around the clock operational service. It produces global numerical weather predictions and other data for members and cooperating states and the broader community. It has one of the largest supercomputer facilities and meteorological data archives in the world. It also delivers advanced training and assists the World Meteorology Organization in implementing its programs. And then number seven, we have the FuseNet or the Farming Early Warning System Network, which was created in 1985 by the USA or the United States Agent for International Development which is a leading provider of early warning and analysis on acute food insecurity around the world. It's, um, it actually provides unbiased evidence-based analysis to governments and relief agencies who plan for and respond to humanitarian crises. So FUSENET analyzes support, uh, support resilience and development programming as well. And I've worked with them. They're very professional as far as uh, climate information is concerned. Then we have a very important uh, um, uh, body, which is the, the Global Framework of Climate Services, 
uh, which is a UN led initiative of, uh, which was spearheaded by WMO, uh, the World Meteorology Organization, to guide the development and application of science based climate information and services in support of decision making in climate sensitive sectors. Its vision is to enable better management of the risks of climate variability and change and adaptation to climate change through the development and incorporation of science-based climate information and prediction into planning, policy, and practice on the global, regional, and national scale. So those are some of the regional and international CS providers, but we also have um, some programs which are simply on demand due to increased need for accurate climate information. And uh, these programs uh, are not organizations, but programs which are funded by various donors and they're very, very crucial. If you know, you need to know about them and if you know an office that where you can reach them, they, they have a lot of information. So the first one is the future climate for Africa which is a research and development program and is jointly funded by the UK government's foreign office, FCDO, which was formerly called EFID. It's also funded by UK Natural Environment Research Council. And its aim is to enhance scientific knowledge and prediction of African climate and piloting methods to ensure impact on specific development programs. And then we have WISER, which I spoke about earlier. And um, in the long term is weather and climate information service for Africa. Um, it's one of those funded by UK Met Office. It has also funded most of this training in the past, and I think uh, they're still doing so. And then there's the Climate Dev Africa, which is a, a joint initiative with the African Union Commission, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and the Africa Development Bank. And uh, what it does is that it analyzes climate information to strengthen response mechanisms and appropriately use that information for decision making. So these are some of the programs that you really need to know. Uh, you check if they have offices in your country or if they have good projects in your country, then you need to get in touch with them. You'll learn more about uh, climate information service. So, if this slide is simply showing a summary of the key providers of climate information, which is the, the World Meteorology Organization, which is the biggest because it's UN-led, United Nations-led. Then you have regional, such as ACMAD and ICPAC. Then at, in every country, we have a national hydrometeorological service. And then from there, we have the other regional ones, but which are also a bit global, like the Global Framework for Climate Services and the African Ministerial Conference on Meteorology. It is regional, but it's global in the sense that when they speak, uh, even the WMO has to listen to them. So that brings us to the end of uh, the discussion. And we have 20 questions for this model, module. And the first question is uh, what is co production of climate information services? The second is name and describe the six building blocks of climate information service co-production. Number three is list and briefly describe the three actors in the CIS co-production process. Number four is discuss the advantages of co-production in uh, CIS. Number four is how can you advocate for co-production among climate experts. Number five is the uh, Number six is list and briefly describe the five of action principle of good co-production. And this one, I didn't speak about it in this, but it's in the notes that you'll be given. And then number seven is what are the main traditional ways of communicating climate information to farmers in the rural areas? Number eight is what are the modern ways of communicating climate information service? And then 10, who are the users of climate information? 11, uh, the question is, what are the ways in which our communities can use climate information service? 12, name any three international or global climate information service providers. 
13, name any three regional service climate prevention service providers. 14, what are the roles and mandates of climate information service providers? 15, name and describe mandates of three African regional climate information service providers. 16, briefly discuss the origin of, of global framework for climate services. Here we're asking about the origin. Then 17, it's uh, still on the global framework for climate services, but we're asking what is the, its mandate. We discuss briefly. Then question 18, 19, and 20 are about your country. So 18 says, are there other organizations, private, commercial, providing climate or ideological services in your country? So those ones we just named them. Um, and then to what extent is climate information currently tailored for final users in your country? That is, are you happy the way climate information is being um, disseminated? Is, is it, um, does it adhere to the characteristics the six characteristics we talked about. And then number eight, number 20, what is the institutional structure at both national and local levels for provision of early warning in your country? So we are focusing this in your country. So those are the 20 questions. And um, if you have any questions, please send them to me and I'll try to provide some answers. And you can do that on my email, which is steven.mutimba at eclimateadvisory.com. Thank you very much for listening.